Welcome to Baraton TV, here and hereafter. This is the Bible quarterly lesson study. Let us pray. I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Petrangia Mangi to pray for us. We are praying. Loving Father in heaven, we come before you this moment. We want to invite you to be with us as we discuss our quarterly. Lord, open our minds, give us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding so that uh, the words we read may be meaningful and may help us to have a closer walk with you. Forgive us where we go wrong, for it is in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Comfort my people. That is the title of our lesson this week. And that is lesson eight. We, we are moving on and on and on. Architects is in the book of Isaiah. You know, we're on Isaiah. And it, it can't be anywhere else. It has to be in Isaiah. Chapter 40, verse 9. It says, Get up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, you who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. We are going to talk about comfort, comfort, and comfort in this lesson. A story that I pray, dear viewer, you'll be able to also engage with as you get your copy of the lesson, those who haven't, is right in 1945, World War II. And I'll not take you word by word of that story because I'm hoping that you're going to go there and see the richness of that story. But here we see a loyal soldier of the Emperor of Japan who fled to Guam and it did not hit him even with the messages that came to him that the war had ended. He thought this cannot be true. The war couldn't have ended. And we see that from 1945 all up to 1972, this man was out in the jungles until hunters came across him. And that is when he believed that indeed the war had ended. That tells me we could be in suffering, misery, and hopelessness. And yet, God has already brought deliverance. Many centuries after the children of Israel are going through a turbulent time, God, through prophet Isaiah, announced that the time of his people's stress and suffering was over. Were they ready to take in the message? Were they ready to believe that this is it? The entire book of Isaiah is full of mixed messages, judgment, and the news of salvation and deliverance. However, the first part of Isaiah mainly is concerned with the message of God's judgment. But the second major part of the book contains comfort for Amen. God's people. Amen. And Isaiah 40 starts us off with that. Let us delve into that. Oh, Pastor Smile. Comfort for the future. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1 and 2, mm -hmm. the Bible says, Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hands double for all her sins. So uh, what, 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 what comfort from punishment could this be? There was the punishment that was administered by Assyria that we have in Isaiah chapter 10. And the Lord delivered Judah by destroying Sennacherib's army in 701 BC. And we also have in Isaiah 39 where, where Hezekiah shows uh, the, the Babylonian official. He, sh he shows them the treasures of his house rather than showing them the God who had saved his life. And God prophesies that Israel was to go to exile in Babylon in future, and the descendants of Hezekiah would be taken into exile. And Isaiah chapter 40 onwards now starts prophesying about the deliverance of the remnant from Babylon in 539 BC. Actually, in Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 1, the Bible mentions King Cyrus by name, King Cyrus of Persia, who 150 years later, delivered the children of Israel from the hands of the Babylonians that we find in Daniel chapter 5. And actually this gives us a wonderful view of the God who we are serving. 
as is recorded in Isaiah chapter 46 and verse 9 and 10, the Bible says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Remember the former things of old. My dear viewer, we have nothing to fear for the future Amen. unless as we shall forget how the Lord has led us faithfully mm. in the past. Why does God give us such promises that after a suffering comes a promise? Mm. Jesus Christ himself told us not to be troubled, to believe in him for in his father's house are many mansions. Promises give us hope. Amen. And that is the hope that God wanted to give mm. to the children of Israel. Comfort, yes, comfort my people. Wonderful, wonderful indeed, comfort for the future. Wonderful. We are glad to have Elder Mikao Juga joining us on Baratron TV. Welcome to Baratron TV. What about our presence, word, and the road? Viewers, this is <coughs> in a continuation to the comfort for the future. And I want to invite you that we need together verses 3 to 5 Isaiah 40 this is what it says the voice of him that cried in the wilderness prepare ye the way of the Lord make straight in the desert a highway to our God every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Presence, word and roadwork. What symbolizes the presence of God? And we are talking to our people who have been in exile. Our people who have been abandoned and rejected. God's word symbolizes his presence. Mm -hmm. Remember the two covenantal agreement of God and his children. Mm -hmm to preserve the commandments. And then his word symbolizes his presence. How does that answer to our first question? How do God's people receive comfort? Mm. And here I would, su I would suggest from the writing mm. that he is coming back soon. Amen. But if you hear even if you are in terrible mess, there is comfort. Amen. Another question. What preparation is necessary for the Lord's coming? Now that your, <coughs> your worry has been cushioned by the fact that he's coming back soon, how do you prepare? What is it that you need to do? The quarterly really gives us the word, repent. Repent. That is how best you can prepare for the Lord's what? Coming. Mm. What does that mean? You don't need you don't need to invent the will. Look for a, a major road. No. The roadmap has been given. Mm. And what is the road work? And we can, uh, we can look at it from Matthew 3, verse 3. This is what it says. The New Testament explicitly <coughs> applies Isaiah's prophecy to the spiritual roadwork accompanied through the preaching of John the Baptist. What did John say? Prepare the way. Repent for the kingdom of heaven has come what? Near. It is our prayer, viewers, that there is the presence of there is his word 
and there is a road work for us. While you repent, also preach the gospel because comfort has already been pro proclaimed. Amen. 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 And thank you very Amen. much, Pastor Titus. Yes. The birth of evangelism. Thank you very much. The birth of evangelism. And as we look at the birth of evangelism, dear viewer, we want to ask ourselves, what is evangelism? And as you ask yourself the question, what is evangelism, you will only discover that evangelism is all about proclamation of the gospel. As you ask yourself again, what is the gospel? You will discover that the gospel is a, is, is a good news. And the good news is the life, death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And uh, it is key for us to understand these concepts because if we are to understand the birth of evangelism, understanding what evangelism is all about will help us, you as a viewer and even us as we discuss here, uh, because it is quite interesting to discover that uh, the prophets of old, uh, beginning with Isaiah and some other prophets, have talked about somebody who was to come. And uh, this person, evangelism, would go around or will be in the context of him. And there's a message in the book of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 9, that the prophet is giving a description of there's somebody who is to come here. And this person who was to come, evangelism or the spreading of the gospel will all revolve around him. And this is none other than Jesus Christ Amen. himself. And uh, I want us to read the, the message from the prophet of God, Isaiah himself, then we'll go down to somebody in the New Testament who's giving a public proclamation of somebody who had come, and that is the Messiah himself. And that is where we'll call the birth of evangelism. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 9, there's a message here, prophetic message from the man of God himself, Isaiah. And he's talking about the coming of somebody here. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 9, the Bible says this, O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into high mountain, O Jerusalem. You who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. In verse number 10, the Bible says, Behold, the Lord God shall come with, with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. Verse number 11, the Bible says this, brothers and sisters, he will feed his flock like a shepherd. Mm. This he, I mean, he was to come would feed the flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with the young. When you look at the origin of something, it will help you to know how you will sustain that uh, particular thing. When we know where evangelism had its origin from, then how we'll carry it forth and forward uh, will be in a better condition simply because we've known where it came from. Now, as we look at the book of Luke chapter uh, 2 verse 38, we will discover that it was not coincidental that uh, a prophetess by the name Anna bears a witness for the Redeemer or to the Redeemer. Mm -hmm. When Jesus is brought to the temple uh, by uh, his parents, there is a prophetess of God who gives a very significant message here. And this is what we will call the birth of evangelism. Mm -hmm. And I want us to read the book of Luke chapter number 2. And the verse that we will be looking at at this particular context is verse number 38. You can look at the entire story in the book of Luke chapter 2, but I want us to read specifically Luke chapter 2, verse number 38. This is the birth of evangelism, the pro uh, proclamation of a particular message here by the prophetess of God, Anna. She says this, And coming in that instant, Anna gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Now in verse number uh, 39, so when they had, okay, well, I think there's a version, uh, Dr. Petronilla, I like your version there. The other, the other time I, I was reading your version, I discovered that uh, it was having quite a detailed. Uh, that is the clear one. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Luke, chapter. Uh, Luke chapter two, verse number 38. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
you can read for us. There's something that this one has omitted, and uh, it's good for us to. Okay. Yes. Luke chapter 2, verse uh, 38. 38. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, it says, Just as Simeon finished uh, talking to Mary, exactly. Anna came into the temple mm. and seeing the baby mm. began praising God. Yes. She then talked about the child to all who were looking mm -hmm. for the Messiah to come mm -hmm. to free Jerusalem. Yeah. To all who are looking for the Messiah to come mm -hmm. to free Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And so, brothers and sisters, the message of freedom gave birth to evangelism. Mm -hmm. And this freedom was brought by Jesus himself. This was the birth of Christian evangelism as we know it. Proclamation of the gospel and good news that Jesus Christ has come to bring salvation. Mm -hmm. and so when we evangelize, as you evangelize, wherever you are, dear viewer, remember that evangelism is all about the freedom that we find in Christ Jesus. This is all about evangelism because this is how it began. Mm, mm, mm. All about evangelism. Thank you very much, Pastor. Uh, Pastor Makada, tell us about the merciful creator. The merciful creator, mm. an attribute that we give to God. Uh, there is what we call merciful and creator. Creator means that he was before we existed. We cannot trace his origin, meaning his origin is infinity. And his end is infinity. Now that evangelism has been born, Jesus Christ is there for us. Jesus Christ does everything for us. Jesus Christ has never wanted that we perish. But the intention of God has ever been that we have eternal life. The writer of this lesson talks of two things that develop from chapter 40 of Isaiah. He talks of the power and the mercy of God. This tells us that God does not want us to perish however much we have gone away from him. Amen. You know when we lost it right from the beginning, he made his way that he could again reclaim us and it has ever been his intention or intended purpose. In that he is powerful. And in these chapters 40, verse 1 to 5, 40, verse 3 to 8, 40, verse 9 to 11 of Isaiah, the writer keeps on emphasizing this to us, that God is the creator. When we worship, we must know that God is the one that we should worship. At times, many questions come, many questions come in our minds that why is this happening to us? The writer is giving us hope that God is still there for us amidst all these things. Mm -hmm. We must not divert our attentions to seek mm -hmm. other gods. Mm -hmm. The writer and Isaiah uh, uses uh, some rhetorics of idols and what have you. He uses this not because he can liken God to any other thing, but to bring the point home because at that point people in their minds, they believe that the idols are powerful. And so he brings out the powerfulness of God in a way that a common man can understand. Mm. But the real thing is God is powerful mm. and his mercies endure us forever. Mm. Now, I look at... Uh, the last paragraph, last paragraph to emphasize the point that is there, that to the notion of idol that he uses, Isaiah responds, already it looks foolish to use an idol as a likeness of God, but just to be sure people get the point, he elaborates on God's uniqueness and brings in the answerable argument that he is holy creator. 
You know, God is always there for us. God is merciful. If it were not His mercy, if it were not for His mercy, all of us would not be. But we are because God is merciful. And by the way, from this we get hope. We know who God is. We know where God has brought us from. We know that in sufferings God is there with us. And we know that our tomorrow, our eternal life still lies in God's hand. Because if he is not, then we don't have eternal. Himself is eternal. And so when we cling on him, when we glorify him, when we understand that he is permanent, then we can be sure of our tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Let's have in mind that evangelism still continues because we evangelize revolving around this merciful creator, mm -hmm. the God with us. Amen. May God bless you. Amen. Amen. Indeed, God gives an answerable argument that he's our holy right. creator. Right. Thank you very much, Pastor. Uh, Dr. Petronella, kindly take us through in regard to the problem with idolatry. Mm -hmm. The problem with idolatry. Let us read the book of Isaiah chapter 40, verse uh, 19 and 20. And I read from a clear word. And it says, uh, he is not like an idol that a craftsman makes from metal, which a goldsmith overlays with gold and sets on a base of made of silver. The man who can't afford silver or gold makes his idol from wood that will not rot. He finds a craftsman who will make it so it will stand up and not fall. So, of course, from this text now, we see that, you know, God is not an idol. He cannot be compared with, no. with idols. But now we want to see what is the problem with uh, idolatry. And, uh, of course, when we read our lesson, it says that idolatry destroys that unique, intimate relationship with God, replacing him with something else. Okay. And of course, when we read, um, we may not read all the text, but uh, when we read Exodus 20, verse 4 and 5, of course, God clearly states that you shall not have any other God before me. Okay, You shall not make yourself an idol. Okay, Again, we read Isaiah 42, uh, verse 8. It says, I am the Lord, mm -hmm. and that is my name. Mm -hmm. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols and that is why uh, because we are saying that uh, idolatry destroys this intimate relationship with god and when we look at the prophets of old they refer idolatry as spiritual adultery okay and we can read this from uh, uh, some text we will not read the text but i'll just highlight what they are talking about when we read jeremiah chapter 6 um, chapter 3, verse 6 to 9, it talks of uh, faithless Israel. You know, the nation of Israel had become faithless. They had lost their trust in God. And they had gone after idols. And what happened? We see them getting a certificate of divorce. Of course, now who is divorcing them? God is their husband. So when they go after idols, then that destroys that intimate relationship with their, with their maker. And again, when we read the book of Ezekiel chapter 16, verse uh, 15 to 19, it talks of, uh, you know, Israel having put um, their trust in their beauty. Okay, yeah. You put your trust in your beauty. You've become a prostitute. You have gone after this other God. You took your beautiful clothing I had given you to decorate the places of worshipping the idols or your God, your God. Okay. And you took the expensive ornament, you know, silver, gold, I had made specially for you to make male, you know, idols that you worshipped, you prostituted with them. So we, we see how moving from trusting God destroys that uh, relationship. And uh, there's a question there, uh, 
we are being asked. When we read uh, the text, uh, Isaiah 41, verse uh, 29, Isaiah 41, verse uh, 29, um, it says, um, all of your gods are useless. They can't do anything. Their images confuse your thinking and are nothing but hot hair. Mm -hmm. And the question is, you know, uh, Isaiah, uh, the author is uh, asking, how does Isaiah characterize idols? Mm -hmm. And it's very clear from uh, the text that uh, Idols are useless. They can do uh, nothing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are told anything that uh, represents God. Of course, we are already breaking the first commandment that you shall have no other gods uh, before me, which we read from Exodus 3, verse 20. Okay? And of course, we also uh, read from uh, uh, the book of Isaiah 42 that uh, the Lord cannot be compared. He cannot give his glory to another. And I wonder, uh, please somebody read for us Exodus 32, verse 4 to 5. As we conclude, Exodus 32, verse 4 to 5. Chapter 4 to 5. 4 to 5. Yeah, 4 to 5. Mm -hmm. And he received them at their hand, and fashioned it with a graving tool, after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Mm -hmm. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation, and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. So you can imagine, uh, God has said he cannot be likened with uh, anything. Mm. And we see the children of Israel, you know, when um, Moses has go, had gone to the mountain, you know, Aaron, the brother, you know, makes a golden cub for this uh, uh, nation of Israel to yes. worship. And they're saying, pretend he is the one who has brought you from the land of uh, Egypt into uh, the promised uh, land. And we've already seen that God cannot be likened with any other. Okay? And uh, we are told that if we are God's people, then we do not need idols. Why? Because God's people have his real Shekinah presence within his uh, sanctuary. Mm -hmm. So well, if we already have God, we have that relationship, why would we go uh, you know, after because worshipping an idol, it is replacing God and therefore denying his real uh, present. You know, it's like God is not uh, uh, with us. Okay? And then we are asked the question, because we may say, okay, these are the children of uh, Israel. You know, they went after idols. But there's a question, what kind of idolatry do we face as a church today? Mm. Do we face idolatry today mm. as a church? Mm. So much. Mm. 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 That anything that we do in place of God can be counted as an idolatry. I mean idolatry. Mm -hmm. So that to say that when we emphasize so much on finance in church, when we dress inappropriately, and that is and that becomes our way of life. Is it what we can term also idolatry? And is that true? Anything that we place anything that ahead of God in place of God. Is that more than God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I read it somewhere that anything that takes your first love, mm -hmm. which ought to be God's, mm -hmm. becomes your idol. Mm -hmm. So anything that you discover that most of the time it takes your attention mm -hmm. and your attention is drawn far away from God. That, that is, is your it. idol. Mm. 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 But, mm. But then, <coughs> don't we agree that <coughs> idolatry or idols mm. is such an attractive thing? Mm. Mm. Isn't it? Sure. It must be. In fact, uh, when uh, Dr. Mang was reading, mm. 
He said, God's people don't need idols. Mm -hmm. So there are some people who need it. Mm -hmm. God's people don't need it. They God's go, people don't need it. But that means you are like recommending other people to <laughs> need it. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that means idol, I, idolatry is very attractive. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. maybe I just to add there, we need to know the type of idolatry now. Mm -hmm. The one that was there during the Israel time of making a car from mm -hmm. there. But what is it now? Mm -hmm. It is purely materialism. Mm -hmm. Our desire to prosper, mm -hmm. our desire to be fertile, that means we produce. That is the current idolatry. And we go to any length mm -hmm. to prosper. Mm -hmm. And that is not good for Christians. Mm -hmm. Amen. It takes the place, it takes the place of God. You see, dear viewer, I would love to take this on and on and on, but we lack the time to do that. But we pray that in your own time, you'll continue on to explore the different sections of this lesson mm -hmm. so that we may be blessed together. Just like there was a difficult time for the children of Israel, we also do find ourselves in a difficult time. But the book of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1 tells us, Comfort, yes, comfort my people, mm. says the Lord. Mm -hmm. May God bless you. Pastor mm -hmm. Smile, kindly give us a word of prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to study together. Thank you for the blessed view of this this. We pray that these words may sink in our hearts and they be, they be as gold, as treasure in our hearts. Comfort us now and comfort us forevermore is our prayer, believing and trusting in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.